The setting of this movie really set up the whole film. In this film, it's set in Japan during the Muromachi period, which is about 1336 to 1573 CE. Although the film is set in such an older time, the fantasy elements of the movie really bring out a very refreshing feeling. The setting has a huge role in this film being that the movie is centered around the disconnect happening between nature, human, and the gods. This setting not only speaks on the climate disasters that plague our world today, but also show the right way to move forward with being an activist and pushing forward for the better. I think this time period and setting overall make for such a cohesive unit to present to an audience, and it did more than prompt people to think about the environment, but really a call to action. A lot like the script and acting, how it really affects the message of the film and intention that's shown. So let's dive a little bit into that further. I agree with what you said, and I think you made some really good points. Um, When it comes to the script, I think there's really something to be said about how it's written and the depiction of some of the main characters throughout the film. Um, Much like in real life, the characters aren't fully good or bad. It's really just not that black and white. Morally, honestly, a lot of these characters are sort of in a gray area. All of their motives appear somewhat respectable, but the way they carry it out um, in relations in relation to others is somewhat questionable. The film in the script doesn't really create individual villains, which I think is really interesting. That's not something you see a lot, specifically in um, animated movies. Um, So evil isn't really personified as a character. Instead, um, I feel like evil is almost almost a product of its environment in this film. So for example, Lady Iboshi is cruel to the forest creatures and sets out to destroy all the gods, which one could argue is bad or evil. Um, But on the other hand, she takes women in from brothels and she takes care of lepers, which is good, right? Or with um, Ashitaka, he's compassionate and as as the film puts it, has eyes unclouded by hate. So he's quote unquote good and doesn't necessarily do anything to deserve his fate, but he still ends up experiencing evil just because, I mean, there is no reason. That's just what happens. <laughs> so his evil is is not so much something that he does, but something that sort of just happens to him. This film is set in medieval Japan as seen by the use of samurai and the costumes of the characters. The casting clans are differentiated by the styles they wore. The members of Irontown wore costumes of physical laborers, not too many bright colors and a bit tattered. They were cattle herders and just like they were in a lower class. I would say their outfits were on par because no matter what culture is being exhibited, the lower class are usually in rags and tattered clothing. The woman, disregarding Lady Iboshi and Princess Mononoko, sorry for the mispronunciation, were outfits that did not match the time period but matched their characteristics. The women of Irontown were taken in by Lady Iboshi from working in brothels and worked instead melting iron for four day shifts. They wore long shirts and kept their hair covered. They weren't overly sexualized or even viewed as sex workers, nor were they dressed modest because their characters were not. They were outspoken and quote-unquote uncommon women. Though Lady Iboshi had the title of lady attached to her name, she dressed like a warrior, which showed her resilience and want to rule the world. And it also showed how women can do it and do it better. The lepers... Master Jigo's men and Lady Iboshi's soldiers were all covered from head to toe with only their eyes showing. Their identities were kept hidden from the audience and they were characterized by their loyalties to their leaders. When the lepers were first introduced, they seemed like slaves that were forced to make weapons for Iboshi and could not leave. However, we learned that their bandages are not one of bondage, but of love. Iboshi showed them humanity by cleaning them up and making them feel useful while also giving them a home. Iron City was a town for the misunderstood. In battle, the samurai dressed traditionally 
in armor made of rectangular plates, shoulder guards, and protruding headpieces. Many of the warriors rode horseback while carrying swords, bows, and arrows. Master Jigo and his men were always surrounded by or wearing red, while also camouflaging themselves as animals. They were made to seem sketchy and proven to be tricksters. When they camouflaged themselves as animals, especially at the end as boars, it showed that they were willing to do anything in order to reach their end goal of cutting off the forest spirit's head. Um, without remorse or recognition of morale. <clears throat> Princess Mononoko was up for the Princess Mononoko from the very beginning was always on the side of the wolves. She wore fur, had her red face painting, um, and stuck by them despite her very clear human status. It represented not only her ties to the forest, but her ties to the wolves and her identity as an animal. Each character's costume showed where their loyalties lied and what they were willing to fight for. This movie is not solely about the classic conflict of man versus nature, as it also takes the time to showcase both sides outside of the battle as individuals who aren't just fully bad or fully good. And whether in moments of peace or in moments of fighting, the film score is there to supplement the scenes and aid the viewer in their immersion. The composer for this movie, Joe Hisayashi, is no stranger to writing film scores and has done so many times for Miyazaki movies. His talent shows up strongly throughout this movie. Part of what people attribute to this movie's success is how it pulls on the heartstrings of the audience. And the only way this can be done is by creating characters and moments that make the audience invest in them. Hisayashi accomplishes this through his music. The song, The Demon God, and The Battle in Front of the Ironworks works well with the scenes of battle rather than against them. And this is because the thunderous sounds of the songs help to mirror the action taking place. This is contrasted by moments outside of battle, where we see not only characters that are strong yet sensitive, but we also hear musical passages that match this. Certain concepts can be nuanced and hard to understand, but what's not hard to understand is the undeniable effect that music can have on your emotions. Hisayashi uses his music to convey a whole range of emotions, and, doing, and from doing so, his film score not only helps flesh out the scenes of this movie, but also helps to, tra- to strengthen these characters and consequently the audience's relationship with them. So there's really a lot that can be said about the cultural context within this film, Princess Mononoke. A big theme that we saw was the two worlds clashing between the Iron Town and the forest. And this really mirrors Japan in terms of industry fighting with nature. We can see as technology advances, um, there is a war and a tug between still respecting nature while... Um, society becomes more industrialized. So this is something that Japan is going through right now. And this movie also um, has one of Japan's traditional beliefs, which is centered through honoring nature. There's this traditional religion in Japan called Shintoism, or Shintoism, which deals with honoring nature spirits and having gratitude to nature. So we see this theme throughout the movie too in terms of that really mirroring a part of or reflecting a part of Japan's culture and religion and way of life that they've had for so long. But there's this conflict with tradition and new technology and how that kind of can create a a big issue, which was really the whole conflict of the movie. I think this movie has a large environmentalist message that um, can really be applied to Japan and what they're going through in terms of finding that balance between nature and industry. And I think ultimately the film is telling us that man can still be in harmony and balance with nature without destroying it as technology advances and they can still, Japan can still hold true to some of its traditional ideals and beliefs about honoring nature 
So I definitely thought that was a very interesting cultural context of the film, just how it really reflects what Japan is going through currently and how there's currently that clash between the new ways of being, which is more industrial, and the old traditional ways of being in harmony with nature.